Hello there and welcome to Distinctions Talks Live and tonight we have a Bournemouth boy made good. He only took up photography in his early 20s after first working in a factory and has become a successful wedding and documentary photographer with more fellowships than he cares to count. He is Kevin Wilson, FRPS. Hello Kevin. Good evening to you all. So how did you get from working in a factory to becoming a professional photographer? Well, by having a very understanding boss who I explained to him that I, I really wasn't cut out for working like this and I wanted to be a photographer. And he gave me the opportunity to leave and then come back if it didn't work out. So I had plenty of scope. If it didn't work out, I could just go back. Did he think so, it would work out? No, he didn't. <laughs> he said, as long as you've got a hole in your backside, you won't make it as a photographer. What he said. Of course, we're talking about film in those days. What sort of equipment did you have? Well, when I, the first camera I ever had was a, a Boulder, an East German, or West German, but it was, it was German manufacturer. It cost me four pounds. It was a rangefinder. And that really is the thing that gave me the bug to do it. But um, it, it's a hard process to get through, you know, buying cameras all the time when you haven't got the finance to do it. But eventually I ended up with the creme de la creme, which is the Hasselblad. So I, you know, square format, um, I had a, a 120 macro lens, I had a 180, I had a 250, I had a 60 mil and a 100. So they were all lenses that I used extensively because in many respects, they were different from what other people were using. Was it difficult to make a living out of it in those days? Um, yeah, it was quite difficult and, um, you know, it was tough, but uh, I wanted to get married. And um, you know, I thought, sort of, I've got to save up for this. It's going to cost a few bob to buy a wedding dress. And uh, I just, um, I was going to persevere in it. That's really what I wanted to do. I love photography. It came about through me playing a lot of sport, football and surfing at the time. And then I progressed, you know, I went to night school and they taught me how to photograph a bottle of wine and a loaf of bread, which isn't much good if you're going to be going out taking wedding pictures. However, what I decided to do was to start knocking on people's doors. And you know, that's quite a soul destroying job. So what I did was I identify an area that was quite exclusive, you know, where people had plenty of finance and I went around knocking on the doors. And so I would go there one week and book work for the following week. And quite often you'd knock on the door for four or five doors and nobody would answer or then somebody would slam the door in your face but then all of a sudden said what a wonderful idea yeah and so that's how it started and from there I got asked to do portraits and weddings so you've got to be a bit of a salesman as well of course and you are best known for your wedding photography yeah, um, yes. why don't we have a look at some of your images now okay uh, and uh, this is a really lovely one really it's about the beauty as well as the location and the composition well, it's about the beauty of the dress and the rough surroundings isn't it well that's where let's face it you know the dress is one of the most important things that you're going to have on a wedding day for the bride and she wants to look amazing so you know some some dresses cost up to twenty thousand pounds or more but you want to show it off nicely but the thing about my work peter is that i allow a lot of space around the outside so if i have to crop I know that I can do that. But I want the image to breathe. And I also mainly work exclusively in available light, um, apart from the odd occasion, which you'll see later on. But background and lighting and composition are the things that really make the work image work. And this is a very unusual location, isn't it? It is. This is taken in Castle Cocconi, which is uh, in Italy, owned by Graffy Studios. And we were there when they had the worst storms. It's 1962. It did nothing but rain for four or five days. And I was there to do a workshop. And we had no power in the castle, but it was amazing. But anyway, I always like to scout around the venue. And I looked around, I always looked for something that nobody else is ever gonna use. And I found this, it's an old um, cold room in the 1800s and 1900s before refrigeration people used to store their cheese and their wines in these cold rooms. So there's an outer wall around the outside. It's a complete circle inside. 
and they dropped ice down the outside. Well, when the castle fell into disrepair, this became hidden. But when uh, they decided to excavate it all, they came across this coal. And what they did, because it was unsafe, they decided they wanted to show it as a showpiece for, for the castle, and they encased it in a dome. And at, at the top, there was a padlock with those steps coming down, which were unsafe as it happened. And I asked uh, Jeremy Price if it would be possible that I could use it. He said, oh, no, no, you can't go down there. It's too dangerous. He said, anyway, it's locked. And I said, well, I'll pay for a new lock. And he said, well, I don't know why you want to go down there. And I said, well, it's, so, it's just what I would like to do. Anyway, three or four days went by. And then he said, well, you know, you spoke about taking the pictures downstairs in the cold room. I said, yes. Well, there is a way underneath, he said, but it's a bit claustrophobic and a bit dirty. So um, if you want to do it, then, you know, the dress may get dirty. Well, that gown, I think, was £10,000. So we had to phone the designer to tell her that she was going to get a picture that nobody else had ever had done before. Was she prepared for it to get dirty? And she said yes, and that was it. <laughs> Interesting enough, the delegates wondered what I was doing. And only one lady came downstairs with me, and she held a reflector. So, in general, how would you describe your wedding photography? Because lots of people do it, although, as we know, not as many as before. But yeah. what makes you a bit different, would you say? Well, I think I've got signature work. Um, people say they know a KW bride, and quite often people say, that's a KW bride. I get certain types of brides that... You know, well, by the look of this, you get rich ones. Yes, <laughs> her husband's very rich. And, uh, so, um, to have a wedding at this place, which is Barclay Castle, it's um, a lot of money to get married there. So you've got to have the, quite the finery to go with it as well. Um, but she was a very elegant bride, beautiful. And I've known her father for many years through photography associations. Do you um, tend to visualize how your images are going to end up? I normally have a rough idea of what I'm going to do. Now, wedding photography, you just said to me, why is mine different? My, I like to have, say, three or four really key notes in a wedding where something is signature, like this one, for example. And I want to use somewhere from the venue which embodies what I'm looking at. Now, this is Barclay Castle, and it had this baronial feel to this room. So I did a quick scout round, and I realised that this was the room I wanted to use with these tapestries and that lovely door behind. There was a window to my right, but it was very dim in there. So I had a tripod, and I had a very slow shutter speed, and it just looked a little tiny bit dull. Although the light coming in from the right-hand side was exquisite, I needed to lift the shadows. So I had some Quadra Elencron packs with me, and I used a modeling lamp from that to throw it in on the frontal light to give that nice orange cast. So it's wrecking from what you say is rather important to get the right location of wedding photography. Absolutely, and I don't want to be the photographer that actually ruins a bride's day. I want to be that photographer that's going to be very swift, make people look good, but get these key moments, the pictures that I can enjoy and their friends will enjoy. More importantly, the family will for many, many years to come. This one's got nice balance, actually. Yeah, this is um, again, Milton Abbey in Dorset, uh, nearly a thousand years old, this place. And I've been there many times. And again, it's a very difficult situation to get into very low levels of light. It's a tripod situation. The light coming from the left hand side and then reflectors in the foreground to lift the shadow area and then of course it's about posing and showing body shape and i'm the best bridesmaid any bride's gonna have <laughs> but it is mostly about light isn't it really light for me is the most important it's no good taking a picture in the back of the background that's amazing but the light is bad in the past i've been known to go to a location and the bride has particularly wanted the castle in the background. And I said to him, well, you can have that if you want to, but let me just show you what it's going to look like. So I'll bring the groom and say, if I, if I put him there, this is what he's going to look like. If I spin him round, he's just going to look like Brad Pitt. Which do you prefer? <laughs> and then they go with what I say. And this uh, next one features what you call Kevin's window, your yeah. own window. Why is that? Well, this is um, Athelhampton House in Dorset, which is a great venue for, for weddings and plenty of scope for taking pictures. However, this is my favourite youngest daughter and she was getting married. So naturally, I wanted to have um, a good photographer 
to do this. And I had somebody by the name of David Wheeler, who's been a mentee of mine for a few years, and his work's exquisite. So he offered straight away. I had plenty of people offer to do it. In fact, Mark Cornwell assisted him. But I've always used this, and I didn't want to get on, I know what it's like, you know, to have a photographer um, working, and then there's another photographer stood behind him, wondering if that's how it, it should be done. So I let him do the whole wedding right the way through. But when it came to do the window, which he wanted to do, he just turned around and said, go on, that's your window, you do it. And so I did. But when this picture I had first envisaged doing it, many, many years ago, I was on film. And where my daughter had stood, right in the centre there, there was a great big font. It takes three or four people to lift it. And so I moved it out of the way to use it for the picture. And ever since then, people have been using it. But we always make sure the font goes back afterwards. And of course, you do do black and white as well. Yes, yeah. Well, again, posing, you know, no bride would sit down like that. I have to show them how to sit down so, and then tilt their body, tilt their head to make sure they're getting a lovely light onto their face. And of course, it works either in colour or black and white, but I do like black and white. For me, it's very timeless. Well, let's be honest about this pose. This is a most unnatural pose. Well, if you no see, normal person would sit like that, and yet it looks fine in the photograph. That's right. But if you if you could lift her dress up and see her legs, which are very nice, but if you could lift her leg that dress up and see how she's seated, you would be surprised. Her feet are crossed over at the ankles, her uh, body's turned one way, and her head's turned back into the light. So it it looks uncomfortable to her when you. I show them how to do it first, but I don't have a dress on. But I show them how long to sit. And then I place them in that position, and then I refine it. But of course, I've got everything ready before I go in there. I know the light situation. I know where I need a reflector. I know exactly what I'm going to do. This is the case of getting that two or three pictures. So trust must be a vital component in your business. Absolutely. Trust is imperative. And uh, all my brides trust me 100%. This one here, again, it's all about her eye and her tiara. She was just ready to go off to the ceremony. And she was just coming out and I just said, went outside the doorway and I just said, her eyes were beautiful as you can see and I wanted to focus on that. And I so said, who, gives, who gives you the most grief at weddings? Myself. <laughs> I, I'd say to brides, if you want me to do your wedding and you want pictures like this, then what I would say is that you've got to trust me and give me the time. I can take the pictures if you give me the time. If you don't give me the time, we can't do it. Because some people will just say, oh, I just want documentary. And, and invariably I'll say, well, if you just want documentary, then I'm probably not your photographer. But if you want documentary and you want some stylized images, then I am your man. Do you ever get any interference from mother-in-laws? Oh, well, mother-in-law's the most important person apart from the bride. She, um, she can help you out of a lot of situations. One wedding I had in particular, with uh, a bride told me her wedding was based around fairies. That's why she had me as a photographer. But no, she said, my wedding's all around fairies. Would you come to the location? Which was Christ the King in Winchester. So I went up there and beautiful church, beautiful surroundings, but I'm always looking for that odd place. And I went off the, the actual church area to another building, which was all closed up. Went inside there. And it's where the priests used to have their breakfast and their meals. There was a cobbled floor, beautiful light in there. And I said, to, I've got an idea here, we'll use this. And you can have your two bridesmaids running backwards and forwards to a slow shutter speed. So it was all planned. On the day I got there and I went up to the, the portcullis gate and I asked the lady for the key. And she said, you can't have it. I said, it's already been arranged. And she said, well, you can't have it. And I said, well, that's a bit unfortunate because we promised that this is her favourite picture. So anyway, I went outside the room and, and then the next thing is, the car came up, the Rolls Royce, with the bride's mother and the bridesmaids in it. So I stood out in front of the car, put my hands in front of her, looking for Plex, and the mother around the window said, what's the matter? And I said, oh, so the lady inside here said that that picture that um, was wanted specifically, we can't have now. She got out of the car, walked round to the room, next thing she came out with the key. So it's always very useful to have them on your side. Don't upset them. <laughs> well, this next one's a little bit different, isn't it? 
Yeah, this is a different take. You know, this is uh, a shot on a Hasselblad square format uh, with a 150 mil lens, and it's pretty much wide open. But as you can see, the um, the focus is on him, and I've used the depth of field to give me that feeling of depth where you can go in through the arch to, to the area where he's actually um, the focal point. Okay, and now for a little bit of colour. Uh, now this is Simon John. He's a photographer that really and truly no one else is like him. He takes really quirky images and you know loads of people love his work and you try and emulate Simon and you, you can't do it. It's impossible. He's so humorous within his work. But he asked me to do his wedding pictures and I said well yes I will of course. But I had to try and come up some quite quirky with him and this is him with his son who's five years old. And it was just a case of going into the restaurant, seeing the light, moving the tables, moving the chairs. <laughs> the coordinator comes in and says, what are you doing? And I said, well, this is a picture they've asked for, very special. But you know, it's just again about the light coming in from the left hand side. Use, I purposely put the door like that so that it gave me a frame to within the picture. And then the colour coordination between the boy's jacket, his suit and the painting on the background just made it for me. Talking of uh, colour coordination, there's quite a lot in the next one. Yeah, well, this one, the, the bridesmaid's dresses were chosen for the car. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> um, This next group shot I like because this is in Ireland, isn't it? It is in Ireland. And this again is for um, the bridesmaid's photographer, the person to her right with his arms holding the shades on, the blue jacket, he's a photographer. The one on the left hand side is a fellow also, uh, Paul Callahan. And Paddy Clark from Ireland asked me if I would do this. But you know, one thing about Ireland is weddings go on forever. And we walked around the town looking for locations. And I saw this and I thought, well, that looks really like a French cafe. Let's see if we can do it. The next thing is, you know, the, the people in the cafe moved the people that were on the chairs. They were so helpful. But I stopped the traffic in the road, I was in the middle of the road, and I just took one or two pictures. It's important not to spend too long on something like this. Once you've got the idea, do it and then move on. Otherwise you might get run over. Um, right, let's move on then. This next one I gather you had pretty harsh light. Yeah, this is to show that you can make beautiful lighting even in the harshest conditions. If you use reflectors and gobos and put them in the shady area and then use the silver reflector and throw some light back in the face, which makes it very demure. Because if I was outside in, um, um, in the bright sunlight, you wouldn't see her facial features and she'd be squinting. So it just gives a nice feel to it. Yeah, and uh, the final wedding one actually is a sort of classic pose. Right, well this is David Wheeler again, you know, and I'm gonna predict something. This is gonna be, a, he's gonna be a fellow of the Royal Photographic Society. He's an excellent photographer, a really nice guy. And of course, again, he asked me to do his wedding pictures. And um, we went out, I'd like to choose a time of day to take photographs. And after they had their meal and they'd had a few champagnes, the sun was going down. This is at Muddyford. And we decided that we would go out, take the bride out and have some fun. And then he just picked her up and spun around in a circle. And I captured this one. Yeah. Well, has the wedding market collapsed? Because of course these days everyone thinks they can take photographs themselves, but also because of COVID-19. Is it well, difficult? It, well, it has been an extremely difficult year, this one, I can tell you now. Not just for the photographers, but more importantly for the brides and their families. And I can echo that because my own daughter's wedding, which was in Sicily, had to be postponed because of the COVID. But yeah, everyone's got uh, an iPhone now and people take pictures on iPhones. Whereas once upon a time you would get lots of real from weddings, that very seldom happens now. You sell to the couple and you sell to their family. But this year, cancellations have been really, really dreadful. And you know, it's been such a shame. Um, you can, some people have done very small weddings, intimate weddings, but of course you've got to bring your costs down, your, your fees down, and yes, it's better than nothing, but I think it's now, it's next year and the year after, although next year, from what I understand, people are waiting now to see what happens after Christmas. Yeah, so there may be a bit of a rush. Those are people lost their money on flights, and myself included, Ryanair. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't totally fund it, even though it was a no-go area. But, you know, eventually they will get married and they'll have their day. 
of course you're not just into weddings you do a lot of portraits and that sort of thing uh, and one of your projects is on artisans yes uh, what what gave you the idea for this because this couple are really interesting aren't they they were very bohemian and you know they were almost like a dream um, very, very amiable towards me, amiable. They wanted to have the pictures taken. And they, they, I didn't have to tell them to dress up or anything. They, that's just how they are. And they, um, they work on a trading estate down in Bridport. And they sell vintage clothing and American artifacts. And I had photographed them as part of my project. And when I went down there on one particular day, I happened to go past this um, building, which was derelict. And they had this old sofa there. And I thought, I know who I want to put in there. So I went over and I said, will you come and have a picture taken? And they just got a puppy, which is the one here. And, you know, I just took three or four pictures. But it, for me, this is the type of work I like. I love my weddings, but I like to get into something real gritty. And these people were that. Lovely, lovely. Terry and Chris. And the next one shows quite a character as well. Yes, well, this lady, she's a famous artist in France. I was going to say, is it a man or a woman? It's a woman, is it? It's a woman, yeah. Lots of people think it's a man. But this is an en fleur, and it was a beautiful place. Whenever I'm on a cruise, I always try and find somewhere that's a little bit offbeat. So I went to the tourism office, and I said, have you got any characters? And they said, well, we've got um, the captain of the cruise um, of the, that goes around the bay in the evenings. He's a real character but that was going to be too late. So I said, have you got anybody else? And uh, this lady was brought to me as a possible. So anyway, I found my way around the streets and I got to her house. Wow, you've never seen it like it. Her whole house is painted with her own painting, the windows, the floors, the ceiling, everything is painted with her art. It was just incredible. I was in and out of there in 15 minutes. Quite a spooky place as well. Very okay. Young do one more before we move on, and this is a, fish, a fisherman, I gather, is that right? No, that's right, and he was selling his wares. This is in Catania, in, Catan in Sicily. And um, what was fascinating about it, it was in the bright sunlight, but I just pulled him into the shade so to get that little bit of light coming onto his, his left cheek. But he was selling this fish, and he kept putting his hands down and moving the fish around, but his, his hands were absolutely filthy and smoking as well. But he had a face to die for. Yeah, you know, real he, character, he, real character. You obviously like these bohemian types because I your, your I next project's about the good denizens of Bridport, more from Bridport. And this first one is really uh, odd, isn't it? Because it's an old cinema. That's right. This is um, called the Electric Palace in Bridport. And this was a project I did in 2015. And so I found that Bridport was a very bohemian town and I started to look around and identify areas that I wanted to take photographs in. So I had access to the pal um, electric palace and I went in and showed them around and I was quite disappointed because um, although it still got retained its lot of charm, inside it was all paintings on the wall that was just killed it for me as an atmosphere. As I was walking back up the aisle um, and I just thought to myself, what's that window? It's like a projection room. And so I asked the guy, I said, is that, have we got access to that? And he said, we don't use it anymore. So I said, well, can I look inside? He said, yeah, sure. I said, it's full of beer barrels. So I went in there and this was all there. So I said, I'd love to shoot it here. And we arranged to do it the following day. And I said to the guy, have you got um, an old suit or anything, you know, that might suit this, uh, this machinery? And he said, I've got a check suit. I said, ideal, come in the following day. And that's what he had. So we found some film on the floor, roll the film, and we lit a cigarette for him, which you says no smoking in there, but there was no light, no windows. So I used a low light to illuminate this on a tripod, and just to give him some directional light to come across to his face. No, it looks, looks absolutely perfect. And uh, this next chap looks interesting as well. Yeah, he was trained at Madame Tussauds, and he set up his own business. And the day I got there, he was working on um, a full length figure of Nelson Mandela. All those pictures in the background are stuff that he's had to do work for. But these two heads that he had, they look so realistic that I just wanted to make them as part of the portrait. 
Yeah, they really do, don't they? And, and now we have a real local legend in Bridport, I understand. Yeah, this is uh, Roger Snook. He's got two hat shops, one for men, one for women, next door, and gentlemen's clothing. Been there for over 100 years. And he supplies the hats to people for um, Glass and Brie. And they have a hat festival in the, year, in the town every year. And he supplies all that for them. A real you character and a lovely guy. You do find some pretty eccentric people, don't you? I want them, yes. Um, and this is another old theatre. Um, this is the puppeteer in the town. And he made these puppets and he performs occasionally. Um, but the way I got these people to have them photographs taken was I said to them what, you know, I was going to donate these to the Historical Society of Bridport and they would all have all the files that I took. So it was a self, um, you know, for myself I wanted the project but that I wanted to give them something in return. So I gave them all the files and I gave them a print of my choice. And well, of course we know now these sorts of images like the next shot we're going to see, when they disappear in a few years time, yeah. um, people will look back fondly at these images. This is another shop that's been there for a hundred years. Now these posters you can see on there like Burberry etc etc, um, they're, they're worth a lot of money and if you look down on the right there you'll see the guy and his wife runs. So the shop is laid out exactly as it is like this and I just wanted to have some sort of form of authority and that's, um, that piece of metal in front of him is what they put hats on. Tall, I believe. Anyway, I wanted him to look really sort of snooty and uh, so we got the tape measure out, put it around his, again the light's coming in from the left and the reflector on the right hand side. He retired a few few months later, the shop's still there, but he used that as the invitation card for his party. <laughs> uh, could be still from the TV series, Are You Being Served? That's uh, right, that's exactly. Younger viewers do look that up. No. So composition is clearly something you consider carefully then? Yeah, I do. I, I look to see, um, I'll always allow space around my image so I, I can crop and can I come into a certain area without destroying the image. But I, I know if I stand back a little bit, there's certain areas I don't need. Which allow, so I don't want to be doing Photoshop all the time. I'd rather just do a crop. So this is another image of Terry and Chris. Now you may say, where's Chris? But if you look in the um, background, sorry, Terry, if you look in the background, you'll see Terry, which is the lady, reflecting in the mirror. Right, we'll have to whiz on a little bit. Uh, how on yeah. earth did you p persuade an undertaker to do this? Well, I get, they were quite keen to do it, they were up for it, and I did this whole series in here with him, and you know, I said, well, uh, you know, is there any chance of putting one in the hearse and pushing it back towards me? So that's actually moving as he's pushing it, but I wanted this reflection in the veneer of the coffin. And again, that, well, that was lit in two lights either side, because that was in the garage. And here's another undertaker who clearly looks too tall yeah. to fit in one of his own coffins. Well, this was the carpenter. He, made, he was making the coffins. But what took me about him was the size of his shoes. And I emphasise that by shooting on a wide angle lens. Well, we'll end this series then in Bridport with an exterior shot. Again, this sort of shot won't be there in a few years' time, will no, it? No, well, that this is, although it's not a great image, you know, technically it's fine, but as a photograph, it's a nice record. But this is what gave me the idea for the town doing the pictures. That shop, if you go in there in Bridport, um, if you want to buy a filter for your Olympus or any old cameras, film cameras, you go in there, you're more than likely going to find it. It's like an Aladdin's cave inside there. That's the one that gave me the idea. Yeah. And this guy, he arranged to do the shoot with me, and he arranged to do it on the Saturday, Saturday morning. And um, when I got there, it was a little bit late. And he seemed very subdued. And anyway, I did the photographs, and then he said, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I was a little bit late today. And I said, so I wasn't going to come in today, he said, but um, because my wife died on Thursday, but I didn't want to let you down. You know, so I think that sums up his character, really. Yeah. Well, now for something completely different, your project called Centurions. What was the aim with this? Centenarians. Centenarians, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Centurions, they're soldiers, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I've always been fascinated by 
age you know, and people. And when I wrote the um, biography with this, so, you know, normally I'm known for photographing beautiful ladies when they're getting married. But what happens after three, score and ten, and so on, when you become to a hundred? What happens there? And so I started to try and find areas and people where people were around about a hundred. So I started to scan the newspapers to look at the birthday celebrations. And I phoned up a couple of newspapers when I saw them and they said, sorry, data protection, we can't disclose that information. But, you know, I noticed that she had this particular lady had had um, her party in St. Leonard's Hall. So I contacted them there to ask them if they passed on some information, which they did. And the lady was 102. And so she was delighted to have some pictures taken. So I went to her, first of all, took some photographs, and once I'd taken her pictures, I said, do you know anyone else? And the, the, her daughter said, well, yes, so-and-so, so-and-so. And it went from there. And then I started contacting the care homes. And care homes, you know, I'd pick up one or two there, and then in the care home, I said, oh, Elsie, at such and such a care home, she's there. And it went on from there. Well, you put it all together in a video, so let's have a look.
powerful stuff there. I know you had quite a few stories, but tell us the one about the woman who explained why she'd lived so long. Okay, well, this lady, her name was Rose, and she was 105 years old. And I went to the, the care home, and I, I, each person, I asked them to give me the reason why they, they've lived so long, what, what was their secret? And this particular lady, she was really, she had a real twinkle in her eye. And she said to me, well, when I was young, I used to smoke woodbines and caps and small saints, um, uh, full strength cigarettes. And then she said, as I became a bit more refined, I started to drink red wine and then champagne, she said. And then um, when I moved into the care home last year, at 105, I gave up sex. <laughs> And I said, oh, <laughs> why did you give up? And she said, oh, have you seen the staff? <laughs> so it was, I thought it stuck in my mind. So the real characters, but some yeah. lovely, lovely images there. Um, now, of course, pre-coronavirus, she spent quite a bit of time on cruise ships, yep. taking images of the rich and famous. Mm -hmm. um, let's have a look. Are these people um, more demanding? There's a guy here with a cigar. Are they the more, more demanding? the normal people? Invariably, some of them are far more demanding. And this guy was a film producer. And he had more clothes than his wife, but he was a very, very nice man. But he knew what he wanted. And every time you saw him, he had a different suit on, a different outfit. I mean, everything was color coordinated, even down to his handkerchief and his cigar. Um, and he wanted to look like the menacing type of person. But of course, um, he spent a lot of money with me. You spent a lot of money. And the next one, the woman, I mean, you, you really would want to meet her, wouldn't you? She looks very well, interesting. Everybody on the ship wanted to meet her <laughs> because she was so different. You know, most people on the ships, really, they're beyond 60. And this young lady was with her Russian boyfriend. And she was so different. I and mean, when she walked around the ship, everyone looked at her because she had an expensive wardrobe, very expensive clothes. And she just had this air about her that people looked. And she wanted pictures, you know, that were different. They all seem very happy with life. Is that because they're so rich, do you think? Well, the thing is, they will be happy because on that ship, it's absolutely incredible. Um, it's a six star liner. In the last 25 years, it's been voted number one by Condé Nast. That's the best cruise liner. There's only two ships that are uh, ocean going. One holds 900 and the other one holds about 700. But it's tip top quality right throughout the food, the entertainment, destinations, incredible. This chap actually um, commissioned me to do a whole album of him just smoking a cigar. He changed his clothing two or three times. Amazing. Um, right, well, we'll be opening up soon for questions. So if you'd like to ask Kevin anything, please click on the chat bubble at the bottom of the screen and type in a question. Now, obviously you've been around the world on these cruises, you go ashore, you take travel images and so on. Uh, let's start with a few of the travel images. Uh, you've spoken to people in all parts of the world. What have you learned from them, would you say? Well, the thing is, you know, a lot of street photography will just go out and grab the picture. Now, I don't believe in doing that. I believe in making contact and then taking the photo. I don't want to go in there and, and steal the photograph in effect. I want to have the, I don't want to be them coming at me, stealing my camera, shouting and swearing. So I want to try and make it as, I like a portrait, but still to give me an effect of what it really is as if it was a documentary. So it's, it's a pseudo documentary if you like, but I love the color. That I was gonna say you do love primary colors, don't you? Yeah. Um, and this one, this was in a place called Kitaba in the Solomon Islands. And this was up at the very top of the mountain. And I hiked up there to get these images. A little tiny village. I didn't think hardly anybody's ever been there. It's just so remote. But what took me about this one was the fact that she had an old washing board there, a scrubbing board. But on the left-hand side, there's a little tiny mug, which is very western. And so it was that contradiction of terms, if you like, that I wanted to show. And that's the T-shirt that was over the washing line that I went into. But of course, the poverty you see contrasts with the rich passengers on the yeah. ships. 
Well, this was in Cambodia, and this is her children, and this is bath time. So basically, it was that hose coming down there, filling in the tops. But the kids were having a whale of a time. And she was so thrilled that I'd taken these pictures. Incidentally, I always give them something when I take their photographs. I was going to say, do you pay them or how do you, what do well, you I do? Just, give them $5 or something, you know, I just take two or three pictures. Get, they're absolutely thrilled. That what I've, about this, uh, this last image? Where's this one? This is in um, a place called Wonguli. And it's, these vegetables they're selling, they're like a drug. And it can give you cancer of the mouth. And all the teeth go red. Um, very, again, this is a market, very, very poverty stricken. But it's just the way they live and they all seem very happy. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, yeah. Let's have some questions now, though, for you. And the first one says, what qualities do you need to become a good wedding photographer? Patience. Patience and an understanding and, you know, never saying no to anything. Next one. Do you ever feel guilty traveling around with the mega rich and then seeing poverty on shore? Well, I think you can only look at television and feel the same way. I mean, yes. I mean, I know that some of the, well, I will tell you one thing. I was on a cruise one day and we were in Vietnam and there was a terrible accident on the road. And, and a man, had been, a young man had been knocked off his scooter and he was probably what, 16, 17 and he knocked off his scooter by a coach and gone over and killed him. And it was a most horrifying sight that you could see. And the, one of the passengers on the ship said, oh, we're going to the vintage room this evening. And I thought, how could you possibly make a comment like that when this poor chap has died? And do you know, I never slept that night. Mm -hmm. I was on and off sleeping, waking and thinking about this poor chap. So yes, you do feel that, but you know, you can't give money to everybody. When I photographed a leper as well, and that was quite interesting because when I photographed the leper, some of these people on the ship, they're so wealthy and so well-spoken. So what have you done today then, Kevin? Because I came a bit of a celebrity on that by, you know, going out and doing these type of pictures. So what have you been doing today? And I got quite familiar with this lady by then. And I put my hand and I said, you'll never guess what's exciting. I've just come back. I photographed a leper. And I was rubbing her hand. And she pulled her hand away, <laughs> which was, you know. Okay, next one. The centenarians, um, are any of them still alive? And no. what lens did you use for that project? Okay, well, that, I'm, I wondered if somebody could ask you that question. The lens I used was a 50 mil. That was the only, so it was one light, which was the window, one lens and 100. So that's the lens that I used. Unfortunately, they've all passed away, all of them. Did you need any uh, model release forms for them? Is no. that a question? No. No? Uh, how long do you get to spend with each person to get the right image? Well, we're talking weddings here. How long do you spend with each person? Uh, well, if we're talking about a portrait, for example, I, well, the way that I work is I say to the bride, they all tell me that they've heard the old photographers take two hours to take the pictures. And I say to them, well, look, what's going to happen is your group pictures, that's going to take, say, 20 minutes maybe. I would then like three sets of 10 minutes with you and your husband to take photographs. And I'll have identify the three locations that I want to go to. And in each location, I'll have the lighting in there ready for when I want to be in there. So I can get in, do a couple of shots of the bride, a couple of shots of them together, and a couple of shots of the group. So 10 minutes each time. Each, after each 10 minutes, they go back to their guests or whatever it might be. I then go to the next location. Then I bring them in again. Okay. Do you print your own wedding images or use a commercial printer? I have uh, my stuff on my graphic studios in Italy. I, I, I went through years and years ago of doing my own prints. It's just not cost effective. Well, having said that, some of the work that's coming through on the um, distinctions has been amazing. Print quality. Fabulous. Do you ever still shoot on film? No, I don't. I don't. Because... Um, I know the Europeans do, and you know, they're excellent at it. But the thing is, you've really got to process your own because it's no point in getting it scanned because you're losing the generation anyway. You might just as well shoot digital. So I haven't shot film for a, a long, long time. Now the next one, you'll have to 
pick one or two things because it says what have you learned over the years you know what mistakes have you made from which you've learned over the years as a photographer uh oh that's right what am i just, what what have i learned as a photographer i've learned one thing about being a wedding photographer is that it's not my day because so many photographers treat it as an excursion and they're going to use it as a portfolio day i'm ruled by what they want and there's a fine balance between saying you know i, I need this 10 minutes or so but if they don't want that then we won't do the 10 minutes so i would say that i've learned when i said earlier on never say no you always know that in your heart of hearts that you can go back and turn a no into a yes so one of the other things i would say is um i've been too generous i've been too generous far too generous when i first started out as a photographer nobody would help you and you know i've helped many many people over the years to get to but what i want them to do peter is i want them to take inspiration from me but i don't want them to copy me i want them to take something from me and adapt it rather than just because it's otherwise just going to be a kevin wilson picture and people often say that to me but i think you know maybe i've been a bit too generous maybe i should have um, kept all these secrets to myself but there really are no secrets the secret is you just got to be nice on the day all right here's a good one what advice would you give to a couple who are getting married on how to choose a wedding photographer well the first thing i would say is that look at their website get make a short list ask their friends who they've had what they thought of their photographer it's no good having the best photographer in the world and it's going to be a nasty piece of work on the day you want someone that's not going to dominate you want them to blend in you want them to be smart you want to be the groom you need to be dressed as, as well as he is if you can i always do um but the most important thing is to arrange a meeting with them and to see a whole wedding not just a few odd images but to see albums with a complete set of photographs in it and that for me is because if you don't gel with your photographer you're going to have a problem you've okay got to, now next got one we want total honesty have you ever have you ever failed at a wedding a wedding? no thank god <laughs> no, I've not. um but one thing i did have again i mentioned i think in my private conversation to you a few years ago, I um, had a wedding and the bride's mother, who was her only daughter, she said to me, Kevin, we, we, it's very important for us, we'd like you to come to the ceremony rehearsal, will you do that? And I said, yes, well, well I don't normally. I said, but you know, where is it? And she told me, I said, well, I got married in that church, so I don't need to come there. Oh, but it's my daughter, you would uh, please come. It was the night before the wedding. Well, my father was in hospital with cancer. And on the Friday, my, the hospital phoned me at half past seven in the morning and said my father had taken a turn for the worse and I needed to come in because he wasn't going to last a day. So I went in there and I stayed with him all day by his bed and he never woke up, but he was in his bed. And then as it got to around about half past three, four o'clock, I phoned my wife, Judy, and I said, can you please phone up the bride's mother and tell her I can't make it tonight? And so she said, okay, I'll phone her. So my wife phoned her and her response was quite astonishing. She said, well, that's really inconvenient. Um, if his father does die, he won't let us down tomorrow. He will be there, won't he? And Julie said, well, yeah, Kevin, whatever happens, Kevin won't let you down. Your wedding will be covered. And so anyway, the following, my father did die that night. And then I went the following day to the wedding. When the wedding was finished, she came up to me and said, thank you ever so much. For, but you do understand, it is my daughter. It's my only daughter. It's an important day. By the way, how's your father? I said, he passed away last night. And she said, well, I'm very sorry to hear it. But that's the one wedding I've never forgotten. I've also had a, a bride that was completely blind. And I said to her, well, why have you put me? I could give you anyone's pictures. And she said, no, but my husband can see them. And she wore a red dress, but totally blind. So there are lots of things, you know, weddings. Other stories, a bride said, oh, my brother, he's coming up to his 17th birthday. He's never had his portrait taken. Would you, would you do it? I said, yeah. He said, he doesn't like having his picture taken because he had his tie on and everything. I said, come on, outside. I'll make you look like Brad Pitt. So he got outside, undid his tie, put him against a plain wall, 
put his hands in his pockets, made him look really cool, and he loved the picture. A week later, he was killed in a car crash. So these are the things, you know, it's important, all studying from that lady or that man who asked a question about your photographer, make sure that your photographer does the pictures that you want him to do, and not just the ones he wants to do or she. It's all about life. Well, look, Kevin, thank you very much indeed. Okay. That's all we've got time for. It's been great to hear from you, you know, sharing your work. Congratulations on all your achievements. You've got loads of fellowships, as we know. Do a lot for the Royal Photographic Society. So thank you so much for being with us. That's all right, Peter. I'd just like to say thank you for having me on here. It's been a pleasure. And to all the backroom staff, and I would just like to say thank you to all the things that you've put on during this pandemic. Um, it has been a lifesaver for many people to be able to still glean knowledge from programs like this. So thank you all, doing a great job. Thanks a lot, Kevin. And thank you also to Stuart Wall. Of course. Uh, yes, because yeah. Stuart's done all the work behind the scenes. Mm. So that's it for tonight. But next in the series of Distinctions Talked Live, we have Mandy Barker, FRPS, the first person to gain a fellowship by means of an exhibition. And Mandy has roamed the world for the last few years, picking up plastic to alert people to the huge problem of plastic waste. And then the last talk of the year is with Steve Smith, FRPS. He's an expert on Cuba and street photography, some fantastic images there. So I do hope you can join us. But for now, goodbye from everyone at the Royal Photographic Society. <laughs>